Welcome to the podcast. Our journey in London with Abdul Baha is drawing to a close. For four weeks now, the master has stayed at 97 Cadogan Gardens with a brief side trip to Bristol. Join us now as Lady Blomfield shares a variety of accounts throughout his visit. In the morning, visitors gradually gathered in the drawing room. About 10 o'clock, Abdul Baha would come to us, pausing just inside the door, smiling round at the guests with a look of joyous sympathy, which seemed to enfold each and all who were present. They rose simultaneously, as though the kingship of this messenger were recognised by an inner perception. How are you? My hope is that you are well. Are you happy? Speaking so to us, he would pass through our midst to his usual chair. Then he would talk rather with us than to us. So did he reply to unspoken questions, causing wonderment in those who were waiting to ask them weaving the whole into a beautiful address in the atmosphere of which all problems and pain and care and doubt and sorrow would melt away, leaving only happiness and peace. On the evening of September 29th, a group of some 460 people gathered to say farewell to Abdu'l-Baha. Professor Michael Sadler presided. A warm thank you to Mrs. Thornburg Cropper for hosting this gathering in the Hall of Passmore Edwards Settlement. We have met together to bid farewell to Abdul Baha and to thank God for his example and teaching and for the power of his prayers to bring light into confused thought, hope into the place of dread, faith where doubt was, and into troubled hearts the love which overmasters self-seeking and fear. Though we all, among ourselves, in our devotional allegiance, have our own individual loyalties, to all of us Abdul Baha brings, and has brought, a message of unity, of sympathy, and of peace. He bids us all be real and true in what we profess to believe, and to treasure about everything the spirit behind the form. With him we bow before the hidden name, before that which is of every life the inner life. He bids us worship in fearless loyalty to our own faith, but with ever stronger yearning after union, brotherhood, and love. So turning ourselves in spirit, and with our whole heart, that we may enter more into the mind of God, which is above class, above race, and beyond time. You're listening to the Journey West podcast, dedicated to following the travels of Abdu'l-Baha in the West. 
So, we'll be on our way to Paris soon. But before we go, let's hear one of Abdu'l-Baha's final addresses here in London. Here, for the first time, Abdu'l-Baha made a systematic presentation of some of the principles of the faith of his father. Our reader this week is Ian Lysett. Discourse of Abdu'l-Baha, given at the Theosophical Headquarters, September 30th, 1911. O respected assembly, O friends of truth, the inherent nature of fire is to burn. The inherent nature of electricity is to give light. The inherent nature of the sun is to shine. And the inherent nature of the organic earth is the power of growth. There is no separation between a thing and its inherent qualities. It is the inherent nature of things on this earth to change. Thus we see around us the change of the seasons. Every spring is followed by a summer, and every autumn brings a winter, every day a night, and every evening a morning. There is a sequence in all things. Thus, when hatred and animosity, fighting, slaughtering, and great coldness of heart were governing this world, and darkness had overcome the nations, Baha'u'llah, like a bright star, rose from the horizon of Persia and shone with the great light of guidance giving heavenly radiance and establishing the new teaching. He declared the most human virtues. He manifested the spiritual powers and put them into practice in the world around him. Firstly, he lays stress on the search for truth. This is most important because the people are too easily led by tradition. It is because of this that they are often antagonistic to each other and dispute with one another. But the manifesting of truth discovers the darkness and becomes the cause of oneness of faith and belief. Because the truth cannot be two, that is not possible. Secondly, Baha'u'llah taught the oneness of humanity. That is to say, all the children of men are under the mercy of the great God. They are the sons of the one God. They are trained by God. He has placed the crown of humanity on the head of every one of the servants of God. Therefore, all nations and peoples must consider themselves brethren. They are all descendants from Adam. They are the branches, leaves, flowers, and fruits of one tree. They are pearls from one shell. But the children of men are in need of education and civilization, and they are required to be polished till they become bright and shining. Man and woman both should be educated equally and equally regarded. It is racial, patriotic, religious, and class prejudice that has been the cause of the destruction of humanity. Thirdly, Baha'u'llah taught that religion is the chief foundation of love and unity and the cause of oneness. If a religion become the cause of hatred and disharmony, it would be better that it should not exist. To be without such a religion is better than to be with it. Fourthly, religion and science are intertwined with each other and cannot be separated. These are the two wings with which humanity must fly. One wing is not enough. Every religion which does not concern itself with science is mere tradition, and that is not the essential. Therefore, science, education, and civilization are the most important necessities for the full religious life. Fifthly, the reality of the divine religions is one, because the reality is one and cannot be two. All the prophets are united in their message and unshaken. They are like the sun, in different seasons, they ascend from different rising points on the horizon. Therefore, every ancient prophet gave the glad tidings of the future, and every future has accepted the past. Sixthly, equality and brotherhood must be established among all members of mankind. This is according to justice. The general rights of mankind must be guarded and preserved. All men must be treated equally. This is inherent in the very nature of humanity. Seventhly, the arrangements of the circumstances of the people must be such that poverty shall disappear and that everyone, as far as possible, according to his position and rank, shall be comfortable, whilst the nobles and others in high rank are in easy circumstances, the poor also should be able to get their daily food and not be brought to the extremities of hunger. Eighthly, Baha'u'llah declared the coming of the most great peace, all the nations and peoples will come under the shadow of the tent of the great peace and harmony. That is to say, 
By general election, a great board of arbitration shall be established to settle all differences and quarrels between the powers, so disputes shall not end in war. Ninthly, Baha'u'llah taught that hearts must receive the bounty of the Holy Spirit so that spiritual civilization may be established. For material civilization is not adequate for the needs of mankind and cannot be the cause of its happiness. Material civilization is like the body, and spiritual civilization is like the soul. Body without soul cannot live. This is a short summary of the teachings of Baha'u'llah. To establish this, Baha'u'llah underwent great difficulties and hardships. He was in constant confinement, and he suffered great persecution. But in the fortress, Akka, he reared a spiritual palace, and from the darkness of his prison, he sent out a great light to the world. It is the ardent desire of the Baha'is to put these teachings into common practice, and they will strive with soul and heart to give up their lives for this purpose, until the heavenly light brightens the whole world of humanity. I am very happy that I have been able to talk with you in this gathering, and hope that this deep consciousness of mine is acceptable to you. I pray for you that you may succeed in your aspirations, and that the bounties of the kingdom may be yours. This speech was given at the request of Mrs. Annie Bassant, the renowned president of the Theosophical Society. For our final segment, we are joined by Afshin, Flo, and Ben in their roundtable discussion of the talk. Hi, I'm Afshin, and I'm a composer and a musician. Hi, I'm Flo, and I'm a sociologist by training. Hi, I'm Ben, and I'm a computer engineer. Uh, Abdu'l-Baha actually gives um, a reason here um, in this address as to why um, there's so much stress, um, Baha'u'llah stress on the, the search for truth. He says, because without truth, um, well, or a lack of truth causes animosity, fighting, um, slaughtering, coldness of hearts, um, misunderstanding between um, populations, between peoples. So, that, okay, that's part of it, that um, prejudice is often born of ignorance. And, um, and, and also, the other important thing about truth is that the only constant in the world is change. And he also makes that point before he makes a statement about truth. He also says that for everything... Um, or in all things there is a sequence and and he's he's talking about how part of the reason also why there are so many disturbances in the world so, so much animosity and conflict is that people there is a tendency to to hold on to traditions to be afraid of change um, or to not want to accept change but change is an inherent quality of the material world um, and so I think the misconception is that truth doesn't change, but in actual fact, like, truth is whole, it's indivisible, but as human beings, our understanding is always partial, and it grows and changes over time. And he says that before he says, oh, Baha'u'llah has come, and his whole purpose is change, is positive change. So I feel like that's why, um, and that's the link between truth and um, change, which is an inherent quality of the material world. It's like how Abdul Baha describes the seasons in this talk. Um, he says every spring is followed by a summer and every autumn brings a winter. And likewise, every day and night and every evening a morning. So it seems like in this world, change is inevitable and it's part of life. Mm. Uh, and he likens um, religion, you know, to that as well. So... It seems natural, doesn't it, to have manifestations of God, prophets of God coming from time to time to educate humanity so that humanity changes and grows and matures. And these cycles are seen throughout the world, or throughout the, the realm that we live in. Uh, everything is a cycle. Everything is a wave. We're constantly moving uh, through through time, there's the change of the seasons, of course. But then there's, there's waves of light, there's waves of energy, there's, there's constantly movement mm -hmm. happening all around us. I think the points then that follow on from that, Abdu'l-Baha um, gives, are, are things that are quite radical. So he's preparing, if you will, um, 
opening their hearts and minds to this idea of um, what's new, what's what Baha'u'llah has revealed, essentially. Because um, these these ideas, I mean, with Abdul Baha gives this address in 1911, and and today maybe. Um, we take some of them for granted, or we have a deeper understanding, anyway, of some of these concepts. But back then, um, you know, when Abdul Baha was giving this address in 1911, for him to say, you know, um, that men and women should both be educated equally and equally regarded. I mean, that's maybe would have been, you know, quite a confronting um, statement. So, again, like to explain that everything's that everything changes, it's just prepares them, opens their hearts and minds to this idea of, okay. I really like the third one, this third point, where um, he talks about that religion is the chief foundation of love and unity and the cause of oneness and not the cause of hatred and disharmony. Um, I remember when I used to live in Japan, um, my experience there was that um, religion was kind of a taboo topic and not many people um, considered themselves to be religious or to follow a particular religion. And the reason they had for that was a really good reason. They were like, well, we feel that you know religion was a cause of war in history and we just don't want to be a part of that. I'd rather just not even think about it, you know. Um, well, this is from a couple of conversations that I had with a few friends of mine. Um, I couldn't generalize it for all Japanese, but, you know, uh, it was interesting to hear that from from my friends there in Japan. Mm. Um, so this part, this quote right here um, came to mind. This principle of Baha'u'llah came to mind that if religion is a cause of war, it's better to uh, not have it. Mm. It should be the cause of love and unity. That's what religion is. Religion means to reunite also had the same experience. A lot of my friends steer clear of religion because they see that as being the, the cause of all this war and, and, and hatred, but really it's the prejudice behind that war and the, the following of certain traditions blindly that's really the cause of all this. I like how um, uh, I was really moved when Abdul Baha talk, you know, talks about um, religion and science as being intertwined with each other and cannot be separated because as um, someone who studied social sciences, um, I spent a lot of time um, contemplating this, this principle, this concept, and um, thinking very deeply about it. And I studied um, for some time the history of um, the development of social theory. And... Um, there, there was a point in in humanity's history where um, where religion and science was seen as conflicting, and therefore, what happened was this knowledge system became differentiated and segmented. And actually, the ramification for today is that you have many, many fields of discipline that that aren't necessarily inter very integrate sorry integrated and kind of move operate distinctly and sometimes even appear to conflict or or people say oh, that knowledge system cannot all coincide with this and but it's interesting because we and my understanding is that knowledge is one as religion is one because the source of knowledge is God and God is one but I mean today it's yeah, completely differentiated and not very integrated at all not very coherent so and even this, this idea of religion and science being intertwined is still not commonly accepted um, by all the, the great science thinkers yeah. of our time currently. Um, but I, did, I just took a class, actually, that a physics professor, a Christian physics professor at my, my university gave on religion and science. So there is, there is movement, slowly but surely. But it's interesting. This is 100 years later also. There's certainly a growing consciousness, um, I feel, of um, the fact that so many of the complex um, issues that the world faces, or humanity faces, have underlying spiritual causes mm. or dimensions. And I think this is something that 
people are slowly coming around to, to agreeing upon is that, yes, we can't solve these purely through material means. And actually, Abdu'l-Baha um, says that um, the material world or material civilization um, without spiritual s- spiritual civilization is, is like the body without a soul, and the body cannot have no soul. The body has a soul. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really interesting that we have a, a, a growing consciousness of the fact that these complex problems have is, spiritual underlines. Yeah, there's um, a really amazing thing about the heart and the mind. The mind is powerful because it allows us to exercise the intellectual faculty. You know, we study the sciences and the arts and things like that um, through the mind. But then the heart is the um, receptacle of the spiritual qualities. You know, in the hidden words of Baha'u'llah, he talks about how he's ordained for us everything in this world except the human heart. Um, and that he he's reserved that for himself. Um, it's just beautiful to think how the heart is capable of such uh, amazing things that the the mind isn't capable of. The fifth point that he makes here on the reality of divine religions being one, um, that's like, that's a big topic in the world, isn't it? I mean, there are so many people um, coming from different backgrounds and different religions and to just see that, you know, they're all the same and one and from the same God is fascinating, really. Mm. Um, I bet, like, if we all just talked and got to the bottom of everything, it would all point to the same thing, which would be God. <laughs> the the idea of that different that manifestations come at different points in, his, in humanity's history, and their purpose is to educate um, humankind, and their teachings speak directly to the needs of that particular population at that particular time period. Um, and I love the analogy of it's like an individual growing and developing and going through different stages in education and their education. Um, so what you learn, say, at primary school is um, at the very early years of primary school is one plus one equals two. Say a high schooler, that remains, that is still true. That statement is still true. One plus one is still two, is still equal to two. But they've learned a whole lot more than that. Their their knowledge becomes deeper. Um, and I just, that really makes sense to me, the idea that manifestations are coming and they're building on past revelations. Um, and there are some things that then they still hold true, but you can see them in different contexts and use that knowledge in different ways. Um, but the basic, I guess, idea is that manifestations of God, what they say may seem to conflict, but it's in essence, it's not a, a conflicting idea at all. They all agree. All their teachings agree. So this idea of, of the re- reality of the divine religions being one ties back to the comment about us being too focused on the traditions of religion. And by being too focused on these traditions, we, we aren't able to see the reality of our religions, what their true purpose was what they really brought to humanity and what they did for the societies or populations that they were brought to. And if that reality was recognized, then then we would be able to realize that this reality is one. Well, if, if the fundamental purpose of religion is to establish unity and eventually peace, the most great peace, um, then part of this is is going to come from our understanding that Truth is one, reality is one, therefore religion must be one, Um, religious knowledge is one, but but then that has to be tempered with the fact that, you know, we have to be humble. Our understanding is limited. Um, We cannot know ontologically um, the truth in its entirety, so we have to be, we have to operate in a mode of learning. And when we are confronted by ideas that are foreign to us um, or don't sit well um, initially with our prior understanding, 
then our attitude has to be one of learning. Oh, that's interesting. What can I learn from this person? Um, and th there are so many things that relate to this, the principle, the art of consultation. Um, but I guess essentially, it, if we all can accept or agree that knowledge, religion, reality is one, um, that we are all equal as human beings, therefore we're all equal, then we can settle our differences. That concludes our segment for this week. Special thanks to Jessica Tafigian and Rory Cunningham for playing Lady Blomfield and Professor Sadler. We'd also like to thank Afshin Tafigian, Flo Fudakowska, and Ben Kolodner for participating in our roundtable discussion. Don't forget to email us your stories to info at thejourneywest.org. See you in Paris. Bye!